Welcome back to the Home Lab and I've got an interesting video for you today and a bit of a Big Clive video. I've got a mystery object. What is it? And what does it do? So what do you think this is? It's a lot smaller than it looks in photographs. I don't hear too many cries of Ashtong Minun. It's definitely not one of those. Uh, it is in fact a $1 toy, although I think it was actually meant to be used by adults as well, pedometer from the 1960s. So let's have a closer look at it, take it apart and explain how it works. I remember many crazes and they've been from skateboards to vinyl records and we're actually I think now seeing the return of Polaroid film cameras. But pedometers have not been immune from this. The 1980s and 90s saw the popularity of electronic pedometers but before that mechanical pedometers were commonplace. And this is one of those. Recently there seems to have been a bit of a resurgence of this as well. My partner is frequently looking at her high-tech Fitbit watch to tell me how many steps she's done and that she's reached her daily target. Out of interest, you might notice that the Fitbit appears to take its styling from an earlier and very cheaply made Atlas for Men pedometer. The box is dated 1969 and it has a childlike character on it. I've seen later versions from the 1980s with a hand-in-hand -hand couple depicted on it. The product remained the same, but perhaps the child had grown up. The product certainly hadn't. Interestingly, both are wearing a pedometer, which to me seems a little bit pointless. The box tells us the pedometer was manufactured in Japan for Chadwick Miller Incorporated of Boston, Massachusetts. They imported a huge range of unusual small objects, including Rubik's Cube necklaces, glow-in-the-dark telephone dial overlays, and even a tea mug with an additional ceramic pocket to hold the used tea bag. They even sold a fully functional miniature photographic peep show. The less said about that, the better. Inside the box, tightly folded up, is a wonderful yellow piece of paper that's the instruction sheet. And it's printed on, well, almost tracing paper, very, very thin paper. Do any of you remember that toilet paper that used to be like this, uh, that we used to get at school? But that's a whole different story. Um, I wonder why that is, but I guess it was for carbon copying. Perhaps they didn't print these individually, but did a whole stack with carbons in between. Anyway, the instructions are quite fun, and they tell us specifically that your Walkomatic pedometer is a most useful toy. It's scientifically designed to work on exactly the same principle as devices selling for 10 to 20 times its price. The Walkomatic will measure with some accuracy, I notice it's some accuracy, the number of miles you walk if you carefully follow these simple instructions. A brief wander around the house immediately shows you what the main issue is with this device. Anyway, I continued the testing. A measurement of my stride length put me in the two window. Walking around outside and back and forth to Barry School did generate a reading, though it was not very lined up in the windows due to the slackness of the rotating dials. I think actually in this case it massively underread, so I decided to walk one mile and see what reading it would give. The results of the one mile calibration were interesting. I went out for my first attempt and after returning home it only read a quarter of a mile. The second attempt read about half a mile. So getting rather frustrated with this I gave it one more go and it was bang on. You might just see an inverted fraction after the one digit but that's the quarter mile reading for one of the other windows. Inverted as the windows on the right hand side for that number. After these tests, it became clear that it really did need to be correctly clipped onto your pocket or belt in the right orientation, or it wouldn't work at all correctly. The instructions, in fairness, do make this clear, so I was perhaps responsible for the early inaccurate readings. Just chucking it into your pocket, even if it is in the vertical plane, just won't do. Remembering that it's the dials that turn and not the body of the device, so at times the text reads upside down, which looks rather strange. 
I did get rather a few odd looks, especially when it was not correctly orientated in my pocket, as it sounds more like a failed hip replacement fitted by a scrap metal merchant. Would you really want to carry this around with you all day? I think even kids would find it a bit, well, very uncool. And as for putting up with that noise when in company, I think you'd lose friends quicker than if you were on a tellurium diet. Let's now have a closer look at how it works. And to do that, we need to take it apart. And it's a pretty simple manufacturing process that's been used for this. There's a couple of sort of metal tangs here and the metal is very, very easy to bend. So we'll bend those out of the way. There we go. And then what we've got to do is carefully lift the top off it so we can see the working mechanism inside. Right, now we've got it apart. Let's have a look at how it works inside. And this thing's got a real clever trick up its sleeve, which I'll come to uh, closer to the end of the explanation. And it involves this faceplate and the dial underneath. So here's the weight that moves when you walk and it jiggles up and down and drives these gears forwards here. And the small gear and the larger diameter gear are physically joined together. Um, I think this must be why you must have it correctly orientated in your pocket. Otherwise, this weight doesn't move up and down effectively. You'll also notice there's a spring here which returns the balance, or at least the um, oscillating weight. And it was broken when I first got it um, and the spring had just popped off. So I put the spring back on and it worked perfectly. But what I'm going to do now is remove this faceplate and the dial beneath and you'll see how the weight carries its motion onto these two gears. Right, so we'll remove these two bits here. You'll notice they've got gear teeth on them, but we'll come back to those. And here's your oscillating or moving weight as you walk. And you'll notice it's got the uh, typical sort of ratchet mechanism here where this um, spring here pushes the bottom gear forwards and this one stops it from rolling backwards. So you'll see it a bit like a clock mechanism, pushes it forwards one position, stops, pushes it forwards another and stops. And this gear on top and the gear below are mounted obviously on the same shaft, but they're also um, sort of tied together. They're sort of glued together. So they move together. So one rotation of each is um, the same as it were. So what we'll look at now is how these dials work and it's really clever. I'll just put these back on and I don't know if you've noticed the really clever thing that's going on here. Firstly, you'd expect to get no reading at all because do you notice that the uh, measurement dial underneath turns at the same time as the red one marked miles? Now, if you think about that, that would mean that both turn at the same rate and therefore what you'd see in the window would always be the same. So how have they made a system where there can be movement between those two and lots of rotation or differential rotation between the two is needed to show the reading in here? In other words, not just one whole rotation. Well, the trick is here. I don't know if you can see it, but the teeth don't line up. So we've got two gear wheels and those gear wheels are exactly the same diameter, but they're not actually the same ratio. One has got more teeth than the other. So if I just take these two off, and I think this is really clever, and I'll just move this out of the way. I don't know how clear that is, but you might notice that the teeth are lined up here, but they're not lined up here. You can see white underneath. And if I line them up on the right hand side, you'll notice that the teeth on the left hand side aren't quite lined up. So it means that these two gear wheels might have almost identical diameters, but they're not the same ratio. There's a difference in the number of teeth on each of them. And that's why when it's pushed round, one rotation of one gear isn't quite a full rotation of the other one. And that allows for differential movement between the red gear wheel and the white one. So the clever trick this thing's got up its sleeve is these two, even though they're driven by the same gear on the side, actually have different number of teeth. And I counted them out and the red one on top has 48 teeth and the dial that has all the readings on it, that one has 49 teeth.
So if you think about it, what it means is that one full rotation of the top red one that says miles is not quite a full rotation of this one. And if this keeps doing full rotations, they'll sort of get more and more out of sync. And if they do that, that has the effect of winding the red one forward slightly of the white one. And that's why as you walk, you see the numbers increase in these windows. Um, it's upside down at the moment, and that's often the case when you're walking. Um, I don't know if that makes a bit more sense um, that way around, but you can see that if the red one gets ahead, the numbers go up. It's not very clear. Now, the last bit is, how can you possibly do that if they mesh onto the same gear? Well, the beauty of this system is, if I just pop them back in, there's the one with all the numbers and there's the top dial is there is so much slack in the system that you can easily mesh two gears onto this little one here with different numbers of teeth. And I guess if you wanted the um, bottom dial to appear to go round quicker, it's in fact the top one that's doing that, then you could have a bigger tooth difference. But with just one tooth difference, it means that the bottom one moves very slowly in relation to the top one. But what a clever way to get this thing to work without extra gearing in the system. Just having two gears on top of each other on a slack system where they're out by one tooth. One thing that's a little bit unusual about this is the stride lengths don't go up in order of the windows. In other words, one, two, three, four. In fact, window one is for the person with the longest stride length and window three is for the person with the shortest. But I guess if you're using it yourself all the time, you get used to which window to use. So in conclusion, it's cheaply made. It makes more noise than my Land Rover's spanners and it's wildly inaccurate. But nonetheless, I think it was an interesting device to have a look at. So I do hope you enjoyed that video on the $1 Walkermatic pedometer from the 1960s. If you like that sort of thing, do please leave a comment because I can make some more videos like this. I know they're not quite FJ's physics ones, uh, but they do involve a little bit of science. As ever, stay on till the end of the video and after I've finished, I always cut in a few bits that didn't make it to the main video. I'll be making another video soon, so whatever happens, do please join me then.